It's not super important. So I should not play it. It's 7 a.m. so early. Okay. It's not so early anymore. The sun's rising. Right now. Okay. My problem is yeah. winter. Yeah. Oh, it's fun to start. Oh, God. So, the, the bootstrap example is something I actually published in a paper once, so hopefully by the end of the class, I'll find out that I did it all wrong. <laughs> So as opposed to previous <laughs> previous lectures, this is not really going to be a lecture. This is really just going to be a series of, of how-to tips and, and rules of thumb and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, he's not so, allowed to say yay because he's ready to just beat the puzzle. Yay! Well, at least he's your Mario. <laughs> 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 Uh, so, uh, are they, Fed's got more than one. You, you, that's, that's shared real property right there. All right, yeah, I'm sorry if you don't have enough. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. I printed out 30. I figured there would be some attenuation in one. There are more here. Uh, so, so, like I said, this is really just going to be, uh, with the tips and how to's, rules of thumb. So please, this will be much more um, much more effective if you interrupt and ask me questions or anything like that. Uh, so you know we've been talking a lot about all these fancy statistical things you can do with your data and your errors. All of it is of course meaningless if you haven't estimated your errors properly. Uh, so that's what we're going to go over today. Um, really, methods for uh, for getting your statistical errors from an internal. Method. There are, there are two ways you can get your error. One is, of course, external, and second is internal. External really just means that you're going to try and Monte Carlo up your data from some simulation. And we'll go through a little bit uh, more next week about what Monte Carlo means. We're going to Monte Carlo uh, So, you know, colloquially, we just be called like mocks. Uh, an easy thing to do is if you were actually doing something with large scale structure or something like that, you can do end body simulations, or possibly you can, you know, mock up your. Pipeline analysis and put big data through that and then get, a, get a, an estimate of what your errors are. The pros on this uh, is that the number of mocks you have can be much, much greater than one. Because of course you only have one set of data. So if, you know, then you can actually get really high precision estimates of what the sample population looks like if you have a million mocks. Uh, the cons um, is that, of course, the mocks must have the statistical properties of your data. And so if you don't know what the statistical properties are supposed to be for the annoying population, then you really shouldn't be making your marks. Because uh, there are unknown unknowns. Right. Uh, it's there, terrible that Rumsfeld said the yeah, most useful yeah. thing about statistics <laughs> ever in politics. Right, so there can be systematics. <laughs> <laughs> this is my like yeah. data that you may not be aware of. So, if, of course, you're going to do an internal estimate of your errors that will like, come into play. But if you don't know, for if you're trying to get, say, you know, the, the variance of galaxy number counts from point to point in space, and there are systematic issues in your calibration of your data, that there's going to be extraneous um, density fluctuation just caused by the fact that you didn't properly calibrate your data from this point in space to this point in space. And you had to know that beforehand to put it in your box and then you didn't. So, you know, there are pros and cons to doing external estimation. So now we're really um, just But there's one other kind of external er estimation, which is where you actually have a theoretical noise model. Like you have Poisson, you've been counting photons, and you know Poisson statistics. You can count that, I assume you count that as external. Uh, yeah, like putting, you know, in, in a mock-up of your, of your pipeline or how what the source is supposed to look like. Yeah, it still has the same. Yeah. So internal is what we're going to talk about from here. This basically means that you're trying to get errors from your data. Um, so basically you're using the data as an estimate of the parent population. Uh, pros, of course, here. Uh, we'll see cons above. <laughs> And of course, then the cons are that you have a limited amount of data. So if you only have five data points, using five data points as an estimate of the underlying sample population, the parent population is going to be a little tricky. Um, 
So I only have 16 on my bootstrap example there, but it seems to give a reasonable result. And of course, you know, it passed the referee, so therefore it must be good, right? <laughs> All right, so let's just start off with bootstrap. The basics of bootstrap. So uh, basically, you have n data, so you get a number of data points. Uh, and then you will sample randomly. This is just basically the definition of how you do bootstrap. Sample randomly from the data. And there's this keyword that you'll sometimes see with replacement. What with replacement basically means is that you don't care whether or not you, you sample the same data point twice. Uh, but of course, you're only going to sample, you know, you sample n data times from your sample, and maybe you get three of one and zero of two others or something like that. Uh, so then you're going to do that n boot times. And each time we do that, we're going to call that a bootstrap sampling or a bootstrap realization or something like that. So uh, if x bar is your sample mean, then your uh, estimate of your error. So do you always have to sample the same number of data points? Yeah. That, no, sorry, the same number of times that you have data points. I thought you can vary. Right, you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to get an estimate of if you, have, if you have the actual parent population and you sample the number of, uh, number of times, you know, what would be the error that you would get? That's like conditional on the number that you got. Like you can imagine getting more or less. Oh, well, yes, I suppose you can do that, but this is just the, this is the canonical way to go. Uh, there are lots of different variations that I will not actually go into in the bridge So, uh, so then um, the variance is going to be, of course, except k equals 1 to n boot, of course, x k minus x bar squared is very simple. Uh, and if you had binned data, like you're estimating, you know, some function, like the mean mass deliberation clusters is a function of the mass of the cluster, or the luminosity function, or something like that, you have binned data. So then what you want is your covariance matrix, Cij, which is, you know, and boot, this one, uh, and boot, bar. Just very simple definitions of, of how we do this. Yes? So, I don't know, the, this class of results kind of confuse me. How is this not like cheating? Like, I feel like there's something. It definitely is cheating. Okay, uh, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> great. So, but like, how does that, comp you know, how does this compare to, you know, getting either, you know, formal errors? Like, I mean, how good or bad is this? And, well, if, 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 you know, you can do an example of, let's say you had something which you knew was Poisson distributed, right? And you did bootstrap sampling on it. You can verify that you would recover the Poisson limit. And we're actually going to see that in the jackknife example. Uh, we do this. Yeah, but bootstrap should do the same, same exact thing. You can always compare it to something <coughs> where it's known. How accurate this is, of course, depends on, you know, the data that you have taken, right? So in order to get the bias of the jackknife estimate of your, of your error, it's really a problem-specific question. And so then you would have to go back to MOX in order to estimate the error in your votes graph. But if you had MOX, you would just do MOX. Um, so can I ask two questions? One, one is, there's a, there's a little confusion for me about whether you should use the, the sample mean or the mean among the bootstraps. Uh, so X bar. I was Googling that late last night. Um, and I think a lot of the stats people use the mean among the bootstraps. Uh, the stats people that I looked at last night were using the actual mean, and then you can compare the actual mean to the bootstrap mean to get the bias in your estimate of the actual mean. Okay. Okay. Uh, for the jackknife, it is the opposite. You are assumed to uh, use the mean of the jackknife as the x bar in that, in that formula there. Um, I do not know why that is so. Fine. My other uh, question is often the thing you want to know about your data is something quite complicated. Like you take you know, a million galaxy positions and you measure the baryon acoustic feature. And you want to know the error on the baryon acoustic feature. I mean, you can use this to determine the error on the baryon acoustic feature, but does that involve additional assumptions or? No, not 
Well, because sort of the example you've given is that you're taking the mean that's of your sample, but you might right. be doing something the, much the, more the, the PAO, so, I mean, there's, there's two different things. Would it? Yeah. If you're supposed to. I mean, you're kind of, I mean, what, it depends <laughs> on your data, but <laughs> you hopefully would not be dominated by cosmic wires. But you could oh, bootstrap but, chunks of the sky. Yeah, you bootstrap, you could bootstrap chunks of the sky, uh, and then for that bootstrap sample, you know, you calculate the cor correlation function for that bootstrap sample. Apply your fitting tool to get your BAO peak position, and then repeat that for all bootstrap samples. That would be the bootstrap. I mean, it seems like you would just get the bootstrap error on the correlation function. Use the errors from that, the covariance matrix from that, and then use that covariance matrix to get the confidence <coughs> intervals on the position of the BAO. My, I mean, these, I'm not, my, my real issue is that this bootstrap involves some decision about like how you chunk up the data. So, so this is why I brought up the AO, because I, I think trivial bootstrap would wreck the AO. Well, you cannot bootstrap this, this, be done. I'm now, okay, so let's go to the pros and cons of bootstrap. The pros, one, so it's very simple. Uh, two, you can actually check for convergence. Clever name. Um, yes, great. clever name. Always very important when you're doing anything. Uh, you can check for convergence, meaning you can just you can make the number of bootstraps infinity. Um, this not that does not mean that you are checking that you get the right answer. It just means that statistically, given the sample population that you've got, you're getting you know the right number for that sample population. Not that it is unbiased. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh yeah. So uh, just as a rule of thumb, this is this is. This is not true in an exact sense, but you should just sort of start there. The number of bootstraps you want should be against for data. You'll see in the example that I had to go way, 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 way above that in order to reach convergence. So uh, is, there, is there some theoretical understanding? So you mentioned Poisson. So I can kind of wise that in the limit where your n data is large and your errors are Poisson, that this sounds like a reasonable. But that might be basically the only case in which this gives a reasonable answer. I can't think of any so, other sources of error which are not. So, so Brad Efron is a you know, famous statistician at Stanford who invented a new trap. And there's a ridiculous amount of literature about it in the statistical community. So it, is, it looks like something a physicist would have dreamed of that has no basis in anything, but it does have a whole slew of good and bad properties. So yeah, these are all yeah. literature that I have not read. So. <coughs> but, uh, and I don't Is there an understanding of it, which, <laughs> for which kind of uh, distribution? I think there's a lot of understanding, but I don't know that it's easy to summarize. Yeah. But, but my feeling is that in astrophysics, bootstrap has been excellent. It's really been a valuable technique, okay. and it's made a lot of error analyses possible that weren't previously possible. So, I mean, but, we're all being skeptical over here, but, but in fact, if you're stuck, it's actually very But good. there is a difference between possible and reliable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so, true. I different. can cook up a lot of simple things that are wrong, right? But they're very fast. <laughs> I can get the wrong answer really fast. <laughs> <laughs> the analysis really possible. Basically, <laughs> if you're a galaxy evolution person, <laughs> use Bootstrap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, just to put another point along these lines, from a statistical perspective, if you go to Penn State to their statistics summer thing, which I can only kind of recommend, but in any case, um, there is definitely a part where they say, pretty much use Bootstrap. They are very pro over Bootstrap. Over Jackman. Really? Yeah, um, definitely over Jackman. Um, I was at one of those, and they were not advising. <laughs> 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 well, so, yeah. so if we could sample the, yeah. that, those courses. So <laughs> I think we <laughs> yeah. demonstrated how But wouldn't you be really suspicious about any claim like that? I mean, it has to depend on the properties yes. of, of the system you're looking at. Yes. You cannot say, use this, use that. I mean, there has to be... Right? There's but, two I mean, there's two fundamental assumptions. One is that the data that you've drawn are uh, fair sampling, um, and then there's another assumption about the sensitivity of the of this uh, operation you're doing on the data to individual data points. So Bootstrap is not a good way to get your errors if you're measuring like uh, I'm not going to think I'm not going to get it right. Some like extreme statistics or things like that. I don't remember. Like, there's there's a nice discussion in um, numerical recipes of what the assumptions are. But but fundamentally, you're assuming your data are a fair sample, and that your the operation you're doing on the data is not too crazy. <coughs> so if you're doing a very complicated thing with your data, 
you have to worry about bootstrap. But if you're doing something straightforward like taking a mean or the sum or right. some basic, you should, not, you, 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 if you're starting at measurement point A and getting to quantity point B, you know, there's a lot of gobbledygook to on in between. You know, stop and get your bootstrap errors as close early to point as possible, A possible right. hand before you can pass it. But next year is, I mean, it, it looks the way it's written like next kind of is the data. But the data is kind of arbitrary, and then you do something to the data, right? Like you estimate something. Right. And uh, that's your x, right? Yes. So I, it, yeah. x here in the bootstrap example would be the mean the mean of all those, you know, the mean of the mass flight ratio of all clusters, or something like that. Okay. Uh, so I chose that one because that's really a simple example. The uh, <coughs> next one will be a little bit more complicated. Cons. Um, and this is why I was surprised that, that they said you should use bootstrap in every situation, and it applies a little bit to what, what David was asking here. Uh, this, this is not a good estimator if you've got correlations in your data. Right. Yes. Sorry. Uh, so you can, of course, um, do I have any cons? Okay. So you can, of course, do something called block bootstrapping. Which basically may, means instead of taking each individual data point and, and drawing from that distribution, you have chunks of data. And I will draw randomly from these chunks of data. And the chunks are supposed to be such that you would they'd be large enough to get rid of the correlations between the data points themselves. And at that point, basically, you are sort of doing a burden of jackknife. So I would just say, do jackknife. Um, but there is literature that says I would rather do this. There's a guy at, at Edinburgh, actually at Durham, now named Peter Norberg, who says I love, I love jackknife. I should do, boot, or I should, I should do, I love bootstrap. I should always do uh, block bootstrap. I should not do jackknife. This is not a converged idea. I personally do jackknife when it comes to correlated data. Uh, okay. So, but there's the big fun, the assumption that your data that you have are drawn from the parent distribution, right? Yes. I mean. In so many cases, right, there's bias in how you take data, and then you're screwed. I think your but assumption, then, though, is that it's drawn from the, the distribution that your data are drawn from. Yeah, exactly. It's a safer assumption. There's some parent distribution that you're trying to yeah. test. So, it's a little complicated what the assumption is. Right, these are things that you just have to take on faith before you begin this process. Well, anything else. I mean, if you're if your data does not represent the population, whatever you apply to your Right, if, if your data is, like that, that's like sample variance, right? If the mean of your data, that's, you know, is, you draw from a biased part of the population, and that wasn't your fault, just the area of space you're looking at was biased, you don't have any recourse about that. That's where you have to appeal to mocks, which may or may not actually have the proper sample variance. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's look at the example I've got here. <laughs> Um, so the example is I took uh, what I wanted to do in this paper I wrote in 2005 is I wanted to take the mean mass flight ratio of clusters uh, from this thing called the CNOC survey. This was, uh, you can actually take the data from a survey done by Ray Carlberg, 1996, FJ46. Just in full disclosure, okay, there was one outlier that I actually removed when I did the example. <laughs> <laughs> it would actually be off. I could have claimed that I plotted it because it's off the top of the, of the, the thing. But it just, you know, things looked a little bit better. So I decided to go ahead and exile. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to admit that in, the, in this draft. Uh, so, um, that's clipping. <laughs> yeah, clipping. Three sigma clipping. Um, I'm sure I was justified in doing that. Okay, I do that post facto, like, I, actually, I did not do that in the paper. <laughs> Only in the example here, just to make things a little bit uh, So the x-axis is the log of cluster mass. The y-axis is the mass to light ratio of that cluster mass. And everyone's got a measure. They've got a measurement error on these, into these, uh, these measurements. And so what I did to get an uncertainty in the mean of the mass to light ratio, I just did the bootstrap once again. And for each bootstrap example, I did the weighted uh, mean. Uh, based upon the error bars of the individual, individual data points. Uh, now, I did the weighted mean, because if you don't do the weighted mean, there are asymmetric error bars. The ones with higher mass clusters seem to have larger error bars. And so if you don't do the weighted mean, you get a completely different answer. What, what, 
so that this sigma boot is like after hearing that a bunch of times with the right. So, so that what did if you just take this, what's like the sample standard you know the standard deviation of the sample? So the weighted compared to those using the airbrush, the weighted deviation is about a factor too smaller. So I think that's because there's in, uh, there's intrinsic scatter in this relation, and that's not you, know, you, you make the assumption. That you're just the, the, the weighted variance. So so how many of these data points do you? See? Sample repeatedly. Six, so there are 16 total, I think. And I, each time I say I'm going to take 16 random draws with with replacement. Um, I hate that phrase. It's a very confusing phrase. Just, yeah. You can yeah. double count if you want. Okay. And uh, I did that uh, according to the lower left. I did that uh, 2,400 times. <coughs> and I, so. Okay, I see. I and so the histogram uh, in the top right, that is the histogram of the means that I got for each one of my 2400 beach grab samples. Yes, sir. You can see that it's asymmetric. Uh, that's because, as I said before, there are the error bars on the top and bottom are not the same. Um, but you know, in the paper, at least, in my 2005 paper, I just went ahead and did the variance for the standard deviation of, of all of the beach of the air. You can do other things. Uh, so if you want to do like confidence intervals, You just do a rank ordering, a rank ordering of all of the different, uh, all the different bootstrap samples, and then you would say that you know the true x bar is somewhere in between x, you know, the sixteen percent. Once you rank them all in order of, um, of in order of x, maybe four percent, and that would be sixty-eight percent confidence intervals. You can do this for ninety-five, ninety-nine percent. You can do something else called uh, bootstrap centered. So I probably should have done this in the paper, but I didn't. Bootstrap standard confidence intervals, and that's where the true value is somewhere in between your mean two and uh, or two and four percent. So you're using actual the actual uh, sample mean and distances from that as opposed to just distances from the edges. Um, so uh, you can see that I had to actually do an awful lot of, um, of bootstrap realizations before I reached convergence. Actually, to be honest, once again, maybe that's something I wasn't supposed to, supposed to admit, this is not converged. Um, yeah, I had to actually go out to an order bank and convert. <coughs> and that's just because things are noisy because the error bars are either, the error bars in each individual measurement very, very wide. So you get lots of strange shapes in your in your distribution of bootstrap means. But if you had stopped after only doing twenty or thirty, you would have had your error bars to ten or fifteen percent. And yeah. you rarely know your error bars to better than ten or fifteen percent anyway. Right, but it's, since I can do this in SM in ten seconds, right. uh, there is no reason not to go ahead and go to convergence. Um, because then you're only dealing with one bias, which is the bias of the method as opposed to the bias in how many times did it plus the bias. Is this the bottom right part? Uh, I'm not going to go to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any, <clears throat> any more questions on, on bootstrap? And so you can also, uh, instead of using your data, you can use your data points. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've never done that. Um, so I got a special bootstrap type name. I thought it was the replacement, but I'm wrong. I thought uh, that wait, wait, wait. Ask the question again. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yes. instead of using the data point itself, you allow your data point to fluctuate within your error bar, and so your error bar second Right. Oh, okay. Well, okay, that's not the right thing to do. That's never the right thing to do, I think. Why not? Because it ends up convolving your errors with your errors. You end up, and so you overestimate your errors, I think. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's always wrong. Okay, yes, don't do that. <laughs> uh, all right, Jackknife. Um, let's see here. <laughs> the basics. Uh, so you're going to break up data into chunks uh, or what are more commonly referred to as subsamples. Um, so, and then in turn, drop each subsample. And then remeasure 
or recalculate x. Okay, so that each one of those is then going to be the bootstrap realization, the bootstrap subsystem. Um, and you're going to do that, um, let's see, so we'll call this n. Have I been saying bootstrap? Exactly. Number of jackknife samples, so you do that n jack times. Can you put on the board the words leave one out subsample? Ah, uh, yes. Drop because I'm going to use that exact, uh, I'm going to use that exact. <coughs> one and only one out. That does not mean that you take the first one out, then the second time is the first and the second. It's that you, the second time around, you put the first subsample back in and drop out the second one. And you do that each time. So each time you are calculating x super k, you've only dropped out one subsample. That's, that's randomly, though. It's not, uh, I mean, if you... Well, you just do it, you do it for every single. I mean, how does the number of subsamples mm -hmm. and jack relate? They don't have to think this way. Well, so there are lots of more rules of thumb for how many subsamples you need and how many you need. Uh, once again, it depends on the problem. But they don't even get the same. We just keep going and jack times, and we just randomly pick one of the subsamples. Well, so if you did it such that n, <coughs> n jack was n data, you are doing a version of bootstrap, which is, well, not a, well, it's, <coughs> you're doing this mainly for correlated data, so you're going to have large chunks. Um, so, in practice, is NJAC completely independent from the way that you chunk the data? Uh, once again, NJAC mm -hmm. is supposed to be, um, if you, you have, 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 have bin the data, right, so, so if you have track data covariance matrix, a number of elements in the covariance matrix and data squared, and so the number of jacks should be roughly in data squared. That, that's a very rough um, that, that I'm violating once again in the example that's, that's on the other side of the data. Your subset will be unique. Yes. Uh, you are assuming when you do this that each one of those things is independent, and once again, not. Even. But you're, trying to, you're going to try and define what n jack should be to maximize. Uh, okay, so you know once again for the jackknife, or for the covariance matrix, uh, it's the same thing as, as you had before. Just Uh, so, this factor here, um, remember that, that for each sample, you're only taking a small fraction of your data out, right? And so, but, but each time you're now calculating x, you're doing it with a smaller volume or a, a subset of the data. And so you need to correct the fact that basically what you're doing is calculating the variance for a volume, quote unquote, which is n minus 1 random over the true sample, uh, sample data. That n is the number of data points? Uh, this number, sorry, number of jacks. Um, and do you re-chunk the data every time, or is it the, a set? Well, so if if I have the number of uh, say I just have a bunch of objects in some two-dimensional box, right? I want to get the variance. Um, well, I want to get the variance of the number of points that are in this box. So I can just then. Uh, so that's 16, and then I drop this one out, and then use then we get the, the mean of all these. Bring this one back in, drop this one out, get the mean of the, those 15, and then just do the, the, the summation over all the points. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I thought maybe you would redraw those lines. If no, no, so, so yeah, the, the lines are drawn beforehand, and then you just go, you know, or, or you know, whatever, just do all the points. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The block bootstrap would be and do the same thing, but choose 16 of the 16 blocks. Yes. <laughs> um, so it is claimed by some people that, that if you have, say, correlations in your data that are larger than your, your, your samples, you have a better opportunity to actually understand that through block bootstrapping because, let's say, there's some large, some large correlation between these two. I do have a chance that I'm going to drop out both of those, and so maybe that helps get some reflected in the data. Uh, in the errors. Uh, this is what Peter and Homer um, In practice, I really don't see a whole lot of difference between jackknifing and black block and strap. Uh, so, how many jackknifes?
So constraint number one, um, remember that the number of jacks is supposed to be greater than or approximately equal to the uh, number of uh, data points for which you're getting a covariance matrix, or just elements of the covariance matrix. Um, you know, if you just had a set of data and you're trying to get one number from that, like the previous example, you're probably not going to do jack and I just bootstrap this one. Uh, constraint number two, uh, the size of the subsamples uh, should be much greater than the scale of interest in your measurements. Or more like scale of concern. <laughs> Because it's the scale where you're worried that the data points are coming in. Right. If you, uh, if you knew what exactly the correlation length was, you could set this explicitly. But if you probably if you knew what the correlation length was, probably you did mocks and you would just stop it. Um, but uh, so if I'm going to calculate, say, um, well, we haven't gotten what correlation functions are yet, but I'm going to calculate the you know the correlation function on some scale r. Uh, I, I want my jackknives to be much, much bigger than that scale R. If they are not, then that means that my data point R, I am getting errors from correlated subsamples, and I will underestimate uh, my errors and overestimate the underestimate the errors and overestimate the correlation. Um, so, so times two, meh, bad. Times ten, good, or even excellent. The size of the subsamples is ten times the size. Of size of the scale of interest, scale of doing your measurement, and that's, that's good. Uh, okay. So now, also, how do I do the subsampling? Uh, first of all, it's obviously contiguous samples. Or else you wouldn't be getting rid of the correlations in the data. And they must be the same size. And another important thing, which may not be obvious to you right now looking at something like this, is that they need to be also the same geometry. And these are not, you know, it doesn't have to be exact. So 10% uh, deviations. When you say same size, you mean the same <clears throat> number of points. Uh, I actually mean the same area. Yeah. So, so there are two different, you know, correlation is going to happen when your data is distributed in time or space, right? So, so you're going to drop out areas of space or chunks of time. However, if you have gappy data in time, then that becomes a little bit more complicated. Then you could try doing things like uh, either weighting by the number of missing data points in the time series. Uh, I, I think probably doing it in terms of the order of the number of, the chunk, in the number of data points is probably not good. I think the same size, it, it, more generically, is the same amount of information delivered to the things you care about. That's really the size. And in large-scale structure space. things, that's basically mm -hmm. area. That's why you do it in the same area. The things that are not space or time. Mm -hmm. right. then, <coughs> then I think you want to think of like, how much inverse variance you're pushing. Mm -hmm. um, so, this was the easiest example of how to do jackknifing. The, the, on the back side of the handout is a much more difficult example of how to do jackknifing. I calculated the stellar mass function of dr 7 for Sloan. So the top, uh, I, this is paper in preparation, so this will eventually, hopefully, pass the referee, even though I may get the things wrong. Um, so the top left is, is the footprint of the Sloan survey in, in the North Galactic Cap region, that's about 7,000 square degrees. Each one of those colors, so I'm plotting all the galaxies, or random subsample of the galaxies, color coded by their jackknife subsample. So you've got a very weird geometry here. Um, and so the, getting the, the, the same size and the same geometry is actually really quite different. The reason why the same geometry is important is because if you're, you, you know, if, if you're jackknifing this and you, you do this, you will get a different answer than if your jackknives are, say, all like that. Uh, the variance of these is going to be different from the variance of these. Um, so something which is as say, symmetric as possible is best. Uh, so it's not just the same geometry, it's symmetrical geometry. Uh, Those are all the same geometry. Oh, okay, okay, so then there's a third yeah, one. Mm -hmm. That relates to the size of the subsamples point. 
So uh, you can see that I jackknifed on the area of the sky, which means that I actually did a version of this, but this is now into the page. Um, so I'm violating what I just said. But the reason we do that is to take care of, the, the practical reason to do that in this specific example uh, is to take care of possible redshift evolution. You know, if, if you're, there's an intrinsic signal um, which causes variation in the data that you don't want to actually call that your error. In a way, it's symmetrical within whatever reference frame. Why didn't, I didn't understand. Why didn't you choose something more? Uh, well, so it was for this specific example, I can't actually do that because I'm using the flux limited data set doing one of the Vmax or like our uh, Vmax luminosity functions. So if you have something at high redshift and I'm dropping that out, that wouldn't have any data points at the low mass end of the cell mass function. So if you do it in area, then you're guaranteeing to get the entire uh, a subsample of, of the entire cell on mass function. But if you're doing volume limited samples, if it's true. I, I mean, also in, in the area, why wouldn't, instead of choosing something so elongated, why didn't you choose something more? It's not elongated. Yeah. That's a it's not elongated, it's projected. It's just the so projection. It's on the x axis and 60 degrees of the y axis. Yeah, so just stretch it to be around. So this would look oh. like an uh, array of tech uh, equal. Yeah, they look, the, each one looks Whatever the coordinates of the survey. Okay. I mean, given the bizarre geometry that you're working with, you know, getting these things exactly right was difficult in the problem that I assigned to someone else. <laughs> um, you, I bet, I predict you wouldn't have got a very different answer if you just put down a square grid and not worried about the fact that some of them under dense. Uh, that's 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 true, but in practice, that's really something that you should try and stay away from. Do your best to get as close to these constraints as possible. But like I said, these are not like, they don't have to be exact. <clears throat> You're not fucked if, if, if one subsample is half the size of all the others. Sorry, I don't mean to be thick here, but let's say the data is not points on the sky, but uh, heights of people in the room. Mm -hmm. So then what's the geometry? Uh, if, if the heights of the people in the room are somehow correlated. Right. Well, I have uh, some distribution of heights of people in the room. And I want to jackknife that sample to get an error on something, right? And so what's the geometry that I'm using? If they're not correlated, that, then you just use bootstrap. Yeah, that's right. like a bootstrap model. Unless, like, like no, tell me about the No, because there are the correlations. If people have different races, but if it's going to be tight. It depends whether you're trying to understand that. Yeah. Exactly. Then they'd actually okay, be true. Okay, so let's say you are trying to understand uh, race and gender and things like that. So then what's your geometry? Oh, uh, I think it's probably just a little bit. You, you wouldn't, you're not, now you're not trying to get the error of, you're not trying to get an error bar, and that somehow gets the differences in the highest of the race, you've actually been bend things up by race and get the, the But as long as people's heights goes. are being measured independently, yeah. you get just bootstrap it. Or do you leave one out, Jack, and just leave one out? Right, you bootstrap on the whole population, then, then do some mean of, of each of your subsamples to see if those are actually, um, Statistically significant, uh, like they're you know not drawn from the same parent population. That you know KS test is not on the on the syllabus. But if, yeah. but if the heights of five people in the room were measured by one person, and then the next five were measured by the next person, and the next five were by the next person, and you didn't trust that all the people were measuring well, then you might chunk it up by who did the measurements, and that's when you get a larger variance. Uh, okay, so the scalar mass function that I get is the top right. The errors that I got are on the bottom left. So the, the points there are the actual jackknife error bars that I got. And you can see the Poisson results uh, is that solid, the Poisson expectation for the errors is that solid line. And when you get to you know, really high mass galaxies where there are very few of them, the jackknife recovers the expected Poisson result, which is what you, what you expect. Or it's a nice, you know, Nice confirmation of things can be turned on, right? So, you know, people have asked me, you know, should I be adding the Poisson error bars to something with bootstrap or jackknife? No, you must remember that Poisson, you know, if, if there is some sort of error in your data, the, 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 the jackknife is actually going to that. Um, so then in, in the, the bottom right, that is my correlation matrix. So every time I get a covariance matrix, now we're going to sort of get a little bit into covariance matrices and, the headache they can be. Um, so the, the correlation matrix, every time I calculate a covariance matrix, I look at the correlation matrix to make sure that everything 
looks okay. Um, so I'm just going to call the correlation matrix C tilde, and that's just Cij, Ci, Cjj. So there'll be numbers between negative one and one. Uh, and so I color code those. I, I made everything positive just for plotting purposes. Um, so now everything's between zero and one. One means everything, you know, two data points are perfectly correlated, and white, that's black, white is things that are totally uncorrelated. So the diagonals you can see in the, in the correlation matrix are all black, of course, which is definition. Um, and you can see that my data points uh, at the low mass end of the stellar mass function are all highly correlated with one another. That means basically if I go to another part of the space and it's slightly over or undense, the entire stellar mass function goes up or down. So the variance and the variation of the points are correlated with each other. So it means to have a correlated covariance matrix. And then you notice that when you get to the high mass end, uh, uh, index above, say, 18 or so, like most is basically entirely diagonal. That occurs where the errors become Poisson, so that is what you would expect. Um, when you have a Poisson distribution, those should be independent data, data points, and, and that's what you get. So I look at this correlation matrix and say, hey, that one, everything looks pretty good. I guess I did a, a good job. Why are you uh, We're laughing at Killian. Why are you um, that's a nice result, by the way. Thank you. Let's see. So, so before I get into some rules of thumb about dealing with covariance matrices, are there any are there any questions about this? Uh, okay. Um, so. Um, when you get a covariance matrix for some thin set of data like the stellar mass function and you have some model, you have your typical chi-square, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, just your x model, i x data, i the inverse of your, of your, uh, of your total covariance matrix, um, some over i j, right? So, uh, Sometimes, you know, covariance matrices are notorious for being very noisy. It's very difficult to estimate a covariance matrix properly. And if you have noise in your covariance matrix, that can somehow can show up in your <coughs> chi square. So, uh, if, if say you have a, you know, you have the diagonals, you have a model, you fit the, uh, the model to the data using just the diagonals, you get a really good chi square. And then when you change the covariance matrix, suddenly your chi square goes up by four orders of magnitude. Something is probably wrong with the covariance matrix. And one of the problems can be um, that uh, you have an eigenvalue which is not very well estimated in the covariance matrix. So when you invert that, it's very close to zero. So when you invert that uh, matrix, you have something close to a singular matrix, and then your error spin will blow up. So what can you do about that? There are you have recourse for these types of things when you just have noisy covariance matrices. Some of uh, some components of the errors will be well estimated, some will not. So how do you, you can take advantage of that by doing uh, a PCA analysis. Um, you know, you can call this other things, uh, principal component analysis, you can call those other things. Basically this means that you are only going to use certain uh, eigenvalues uh, estimated from the covariance matrix. Um, so, so basically just you're going to diagonalize your matrix, you get your uh, eigenvalues, lambda, your eigenvectors, so now this is the covariance matrix of your eigenvectors, this is what you can call your rotation matrix, so you can now take the data and you can rotate it into the frame of the principal components and calculate your, uh, um, your chi-square that way. So, in terms of now, in the, the space of the, of the eigenvectors, um, your chi-square, I just want to NPCA, uh, or you know, the, the total number of PCAs available to you is the number of, of eigenvalues that you've got. Uh, y beta i minus y model i. Talk about your eigenvalue, and y is now this rotation. So either data or model transpose of your rotation matrix uh, 
divided by uh, diagonal error. So you basically rotate your, your model and your data into the frame of the principal components, and then you can just sum over the principal components, and normally you would have them rank ordered in terms of the most important principal component, the least important principal component. That basically means the one with the largest eigenvalue and the one with the smallest eigenvalue, and you can cut off the ones with the smallest eigenvalues. Uh, and then you are, of course, so if, if NPCA is equal to the number of uh, diagonal elements in your grades matrix, these two are equivalent. Uh, but if you can determine that you've got noise in your covariance matrix, you can truncate NPCA and make it less than a number of diagonals. So how do you determine when you do this? So now, now your, your, your chi-square has got a less obvious mean, right? Uh, it's because you put a choice in the problem of what NPCA you're going to do. So if you just want to look at, so PCA i, and this is cumulative variance. Um, so basically summing up all of the all of the eigenvalues. So probably the you'll get most of your information from the first couple of principal components, so the cumulative variance will rise up very rapidly, and then eventually you get to the point where you plateau and you're not getting any, any extra information from uh, from adding extra uh, principal components. So you might say, well, you know, I'll just stop here and I won't use uh, I won't use anything from the plateau between the cumulative variance. Um, if you're doing a goodness of fit calculation, and I'm one of the bad people who does goodness of fit calculations, even though I don't know whether or not I've got Gaussian error bars, so I just chi squared divided by the number of degrees of freedom. Um, now the number of degrees of freedom is not the total number of data points, it's the number of principal components. So that's a, a reasonable way of taking into account the fact that you're not using all of the information in the covariance matrix, you're just trying to use the best information in the covariance matrix. So, um, then stability of the covariance matrix. Also, the test to find out whether or not you've got a good covariance matrix. These are just, once again, simple rules of thumb, tools. They're not exact, but they, will sh they won't tell you if your covariance matrix is right. They will tell you if your covariance matrix is totally screwed. Um, so, so, if you have, say, bin data, you've got 15 bins um, of some mass function or something like that, and you have a fit to that, and you get a chi-square from that, and you want to see whether or not it's, ro it's robust with the covariance matrix, you can use every other data point, redo the fit, and show that it's going to be used within the errors of the original fit. Um, basically, you get the same mean, but just now you get slightly, uh, slightly larger errors in, in the parameters. Uh, let's also, rebin your data. All of your results should be robust to rebinning of your data. So if you make your bins twice as small or twice as well, twice as big might be a problem if you have strong gradients in your model or something like that. So if you do twice as bins are twice as small, hopefully you should once again get the exact same uh, exact same results. So if if the, your result depends on which data points you use, um, you know, in a sparse sample, in an evenly sampled way, or just in the binning of your data, then you know that some kind of points are probably wrong with. Uh, with your analysis. And the first place to look is your current matrix. Yeah. Is it, does there have to be some limit to that? I mean, if I make my bin small enough that I'm just sampling with one data point, then you don't have a distribution. Yeah, I mean, this is all, you have to use common sense okay. um, on all of these things. Uh, all right, any question on how to, on, on care and feeding of your, of your fat current matrix? <laughs> Honestly, the first time I ever went to a Sloan meeting, I thought all science, all all it was, all of science was just simply calculating covariance matrices. That's all I ever saw. It was like, oh, I've got some result. Here's the covariance matrix. Slap, and we'd all talk about the covariance matrix. And I almost, I almost quit from science. <laughs> because you could be doing the same thing but making more. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Of the people that I'm thinking of, you know, <laughs> had that opportunity also, and decided to stay in this room. Mike, Mike being Mike Blanton being one of them. Uh, so just in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about correlation functions. This is going to be very astro specific, so I apologize because this is here. Uh, but correlation functions are something that you would have to have a covariance matrix uh, for in order to do any sort of analysis. Correlation functions um, are things that you're going to see everywhere in astronomy. 
Um, you will see them in a lot of other places as well. Uh, so it's just it's a good idea to know what a, co a correlation function means and how to estimate it. So correlation functions. Uh, and as with everything, all of the you know the wiki page entries and all these things are actually quite good. I've looked at all of them myself very recently. Um, and it's interesting that when you go to the, court with the wiki page for correlation functions, the first thing they mention is an example where it's used is astronomy. And the second example after that is finance. <laughs> <laughs> Make of that what you will. Let <laughs> me tell who writes Wikipedia pages. <laughs> uh, so you have some quantity um, x at some position in space or time tau. Uh, and there is some mean over all tau of that quantity x. So I'm going to define this contrast. Contrast, you can read my handwriting at all. x tau minus x bar divided by x bar. So I'm dividing out the mean at every point in the inner space we're uh, The covariance, the definition of the covariance matrix, or the definition of the correlation function, which I will use as psi. Uh, uh, Tau is uh, so when I do this, I'm talking about a contiguous field of something, and every place in that field, I can calculate my quantity that the uh, x and get its contrast delta. So usually in astronomy, this is going to be density. You're doing a density contrast uh, for uh, we're actually going to use correlation functions as one of our tests for convergence of our Markov chains next week. Um, and so that's a good, you know, this is a good introduction to that. In terms of finance, I guess you would be doing this in terms of stock prices. You want to see, I, I think that's probably, since obviously stock prices are going to be correlated in, in time with themselves, probably you want to do it as a cross correlation between two different stock prices. Um, but, uh, so basically what this means is the, uh, um, the mean square uh, contrast on some scale down. Um, so this is, I'm writing this down as though this is a contiguous field. If you're talking about galaxies, which is where you see this a billion different times uh, in astronomy. Um, so we're doing with discrete objects. Basically you just, like galaxies. Just count your pairs on some scale. R. Uh, so then, for galaxies, the correlation function on some scale R is just all right. DD meaning number of pairs, data one, data two, and I have to then normalize by how many pairs I would get in a random distribution. Um, and subtract off one. So the definition of this means, uh, what is if you have a galaxy at some point in space, what is the probability of finding another galaxy, some separation r, away from that first galaxy above random? So in a random, you know, even in a random distribution, uh, there will be, of course, pairs at some separation r. By random, you really mean uniform, right? Because you're saying you're taking off a mean level. It's contrast over a mean level. Uh, I don't know if I really mean uniform in the sense that when I put down randoms to do the correlation function, I don't equally space them. I think you mean Poisson distributed. Yes, I mean Poisson distributed. But it is interesting that that we call, which is we consider the null hypothesis the most uniform null hypothesis. But it's interesting because that most people wouldn't use random to mean uniform or uniform to mean random. But, but anyway, it's, it's the null, really. The RR is really the null. Yeah, okay. Uh, if I have some like data set of finite size, um, about how large can I take tau before my this? I, I can't really calculate this very well. Oh, well, that's we're going to get into that with the interval constraint. Okay. Um, but let me just you know there is of course many 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 different estimators for how you would do this for the galaxies themselves. The most popular is this thing called Blaney's Lay estimator. Just so you know, when people reference this, which they do will all the time. So this is dd minus 2 dr. So you, now you have pairs between data and randoms. This is your minimal variance estimator, supposedly, for the two-point correlation. 
for Gaussian fields. For Gaussian fields. Um, people basically stopped in 93 after they published this. It's probably probably worth revisiting, so if anybody wants a thesis project, you know, try and figure out. Well, I'm sure there are better estimators. I'm certain of it. I mean, this, this, this I believe, was, was, uh, was concocted with the idea of having small sets of data, which, of course, now with Sloan, we do not have small sets of data. But we want to bring these uh, estimates out to very, very large separations. And so probably land isolate might not be the best if you're talking about said very large numbers of data, but you're trying to get signals that are very, very close to zero. So once again, if someone wants a thesis project, advised by someone who's not me. Um, one thing I would say is that the land is an estimator should be the first thing you write down. Should not be that silly yeah. thing that you wrote on top. <laughs> <laughs> because of your of your of your de own definition, right? Yeah. Your definition was that oh, delta yeah, 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 is, yeah, yeah, yeah. is x minus x bar over x bar. So just replace x by d, mm -hmm. x bar by r, put two of them together, takes a per expectation value, and is that form. So I never understood how people, you know, anyway. <laughs> it's a historic mistake that people started with that. Okay? You're in a safe space, Ramon. You can yeah. tell us how you really feel. <laughs> no, I'm saying that, that, that you could have derived the land is an estimator yeah. from you, the, the, the yeah. definition of delta, and nobody mm -hmm. would, whereas putting this other thing, yeah. you, you don't know where it's coming from. Right? So, It's been like 20 years. <laughs> so if I, if, so I've, as was the question, um, I have some finite region in space with a bunch of points inside it. I want to get the cal cal calculate the correlation function for that. If I was able to calculate the correlation function over, say, all of that space, um, and then I integrated over the volume, what would be uh, what would be the total integral? Zero, basically, right? You can't have um, something be clustered on the scale of the sample itself, right? So you're trying to basically, you would just recover if you did the one plus, you would recover the mean density, and you subtract off the mean density, you get zero. Uh, so that means that if you had some really large region in space, and the correlation function, you know, is supposed to be maybe some power law, log r, log xi, and you say. This is the true correlation between your data points. It doesn't matter what the scale is. Um, but now I actually only have data for this tiny little subsample of my huge volume sample. Um, so I still am subject to the integral constraint. I'm still subject to the idea that, that if, if I have my measurement over all of this space, I have to recover the mean density of that space. So uh, I'm going to get zero if I integrate over the entire correlation of this thing. So that means that in this small subsample region, if I calculate the correlation function, I have to go, uh, go away from the actual true correlation function in order to enforce this constraint. And this then, where this deviation happens is set by the scale of your sample. So once again, these are all rules of thumb. I'm sure there are probably exact things you can do depending on you know, what, the, what the correlation function looks like. But if you're anywhere near, if you're a factor of two away from the size of your sample, that's probably really bad. You're going to be affected by the you know, Factor of 10, you're probably safe. Once again, astronomy's all over magnitude, factor of two, bad, factor of 10, good. Um, but just to clarify, your point is that if you apply that estimator, you must get a correlation function which passes through zero before the edge of your sample. Yes. This is all, you know, this is also something intrinsically true of the of the you know, correlation function of the dark matter in the universe. It will go below zero and it will come back up because you have to you know, basically get the, the mean matter that's in the universe. That happens mm -hmm. around that in the universe. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that people, like, not, not in boss, yeah. not in boss, but I believe people have seen that in, 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 in larger volume quasar samples that of course are much more shot noise. Uh, we so hopefully yes.
hopefully we will actually confirm that we go below zero in the correlation function uh, with the largest spectroscopic sample of galaxies to date. Uh, so that was just a little introduction of what a correlation function is and, and possible vagaries that can result if we're going to use this next week with, with uh, markup chains. Um, any questions? All right, great. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> 